you don't mind. Okay. Um, good afternoon and welcome to Palisades Village. I'm Andrea Sakosh, I'm the director here. And we're delighted to have you here. Uh, it's much cooler here than it is outside. So it's a great thing to do on a Wednesday afternoon. This event is being recorded as you have previously heard. The Palisades Village Events Committee has come up with a wonderful uh, breadth of programs during the pandemic. And uh, this one is going to be no exception for all of these wonderful, interesting virtual programs. And we're so fortunate to live in a community where our neighbors are so willing to share their gifts and talents with one another. And Chris Brown is no exception to that. He lives in our neighborhood right on Q Street and he's been a, a great supporter of Palisades Village. Chris has been canoeing for over 50 years and has paddled in all 50 states, which is quite an accomplishment. I'm still waiting to get to Alaska. So I still, I'm still holding out at for 49. So I got to get to my 50th. <laughs> In 1990, Chris was fascinated by the Washington Canoe Club's unique history and riverfront recreation. It is my pleasure to introduce Chris Brown as he shares uh, about the club's history and the coming of age of outdoor recreation and social clubs. Chris, take it away. Uh, great, thanks so much, Andrea. And uh, Erica, thank you too uh, for uh, getting this all set up today. Uh, it's good to see some friends there. Uh, Sally Strain just joined. Sally and I were, became um, very active 30 years ago, more than 30 years ago, trying to uh, save the old Georgetown Spur and turn it into a trail, the Capitol Crescent Trail. So Sally, good to have you on this, this call today. Um, so uh, um, it's really great to be here with Palisades Village. Uh, I've been just amazed at the job that the village has done during the pandemic to keeping us all connected and our spirits up. And I'm just uh, so, so appreciative um, of that. And uh, so with that, I will um, jump in and uh, I've done several of these book talks and there's always a glitch or two. So let's see if we can uh, have our glitch right at the beginning and then uh, we'll move on. So um, let's try this. Okay, and okay, can people see the screen okay? Yeah, great, good. Uh, what I'd like to do um, is I've got a bunch of slides um, Probably half of them are in my book. Uh, half of them are uh, slides I wasn't able to include. I looked at probably 10,000 images uh, in newspaper articles and so on in preparing this book, which I did over three years starting in, 19, in uh, 2017. And um, I've scanned or copied or saved about 1,000 of them. I could only two, use about 200 in the book, which was heartbreaking. So I've got... Uh, um, quite a few that I'd like to uh, use and show, and you'll be seeing some of those today. So, and, and then some that are also in the book. So this is um, a view of the Washington Canoe Club. I suspect many of you have seen it um, from the George Washington Parkway, from the river, uh, from behind it on the Capitol Crescent Trail from off Key Bridge, but it's this wonderful old um, uh, Victorian building that uh, was um, built in 1904 with the, uh, with the um, halls of Georgetown University and uh, Healy Hall up behind it. Okay. The book I, I published, uh, Images of America, came out in this past November and it uh, captures kind of the history of the club. I, I did it for a couple of reasons. One, one it was, it was just, I loved looking at the old pictures and learning about this unique piece of Washington history. I also did it partly to document um, the club, because you never know the future. The uh, building is very dilapidated. Uh, we just just completed a 50, 60 year lease with the National Park Service. So we're there for a while. But when I was doing the book, it was very much up in the air whether the institution was even gonna go, continue. So I, I wanted to get down whatever history there was and that people knew in the book. Um, this is a wider <laughs> angle picture of, the, uh, of what's on the cover of the book. And this kind of captures the four parts of my talk today. 
I want to talk about the boathouse itself a little bit, uh, just to give you a, a sense of the ar architecturally what that is. Secondly, I want to talk about what life is like, the life in hard times on the banks of the Potomac River for, for a club like this. Thirdly, I want to talk about the kind of craft that people have paddled in, who, um, who some of the paddlers have been, both recreational and competitive. And then fourthly, I want to talk about the club as kind of a social institution, a social entity, and how that reflects some of the history of um, Washington, DC. I will um, pause every now and then, um, probably three or four times during the slideshow, just uh, if there are questions, and then we'll have some time for questions at the end. So starting with the uh, boathouse itself, in 1904, this article appeared in the Washington Post, uh, entitled Paddlers of Canoes. It described the founding by uh, a group of uh, boaters who had been both rowers and canoeists, but they wanted a institution dedicated solely to uh, canoeing. So they got a local architect, uh, George B. Hales, to design this boathouse. Uh, Hales was actually from the Boston area and very familiar with the, um, with the Victorian architecture, the wood shingle uh, and gabled uh, boathouses on the Charles River around Boston. So um, that was really what he brought to Washington. And this was his initial design of what the clubhouse might look like. And um, you can see Victorian elements, the, uh, the turrets and uh, towers and the uh, doors and, and uh, gable and so on. It's um, kind of a classic, classic look. So the club was built uh, in three stages. Uh, this was the initial stage, which was built uh, mostly by our members. Uh, and some of it, uh, uh, the lore is that it was just salvaged lumber, uh, but they did have an architect and built the, this, um, um, this building. This is a nice postcard from 1915. You see uh, Georgetown University uh, up above. And we've never been able to figure out why there's so many motorboats because we were never a yacht club. And uh, in fact, we're the opposite of, of a motorboating crowd. <clears throat> the, cl uh, the clubhouse grew over the years with addition. Uh, and the other thing, and you'll see later in the show, was there have been many structures on either side of us. Uh, and here you see the Washington Canoe Club there, but downstream is a long uh, set of boat bays um, that belonged to another uh, boathouse called Dempsey's Boathouse, which was had been built actually a couple of years before Washington Canoe Club. And I'll talk a little bit more about Dempsey's later, but this is kind of the full build out of the club as you can, you can see. And this is probably about 1925. Um, inside the club had some wonderful spaces. My favorite was the ballroom, which is a, a huge uh, corbelled uh, fireplace and vaulted ceiling, uh, uh, dances, socials, theatricals, all kinds of activities took place over time inside the ballroom. On the first floor, we have a marvelous, um, marvelous mural uh, freeze, uh, kind of a cartoon that was done by a, an award-winning cartoonist by the name of Felix Mahoney, who uh, drew cartoons for the uh, Washington Evening Star. Uh, he was a member of the club and he, uh, he captured all the founding members of, the freeze is actually 67 feet long. It goes for around four sides of a room and it's just, um, not terribly complimentary of some of the early members of the club, but uh, he, uh, he had fun had fun with it. And it's still, it's still there and we're in the process of figuring out how to conserve that. Uh, so that's, um, that's kind of a little bit about the boathouse. Anybody have any questions before I go on? Carol, you look like you're talking, but not unmuted. Carol, you're muted. Okay. Here, here I am. Okay. Um, my quick question is, um, I see a lot of women in dresses at the time that the club was established. Were there women canoeists at, at that time? Uh, there were, and I will be talking about that. That's a very interesting part of the club history. So I'll, I'll be talking a little more about that. Thank you. Good. Okay, second, our, our, our uh, life beside the Potomac River. This is a, um, I'm sorry, the scale here, uh, but this is a picture of looking across the river from Virginia in about 1864, 1865. Uh, what you see on the left is the original buildings of Georgetown University. 
on the on the heights, uh, Old North it was called. There was a series of buildings. Uh, you can see, I think, to the far right in the picture is um, the uh, Francis Scott Key House. Uh, you can see, uh, if you look carefully, there are canal boats in the canal there uh, up the bank. The old aqueduct bridge. This was before it became a wagon bridge. Well, no, it has become a wagon bridge here because you can see the causeway leading from the end of it to Canal Road. Uh, later, it became uh, used for trolleys and other, other, other kinds of conveyances. The Washington Canoe Club is going to be smack in the middle of this picture eventually. Um, one other picture of the Civil War era, uh, which shows uh, uh, the aqueduct bridge a little more clearly uh, in the background. Uh, this is shot uh, upstream looking up from what was then called Mason's Island, now Roosevelt Island. Uh, wonderful picture. I, Love the barge here uh, being towed. You can actually see the cable of the barge crossing from Virginia shore over toward Georgetown with the uh, two uh, horse and buggies uh, atop the barge. But just to give you a sense of the early history of, of, of the river. Looking now from the aqueduct bridge up toward Georgetown and in the left foreground, you see two things uh, of note. One is a big mill which ran actually on water power coming out of the canal. You can see the canal boats in winter there. Um, and you can also see a railroad trestle, which is a very interesting part of the story. Another picture of the trestle uh, and the mill there. Um, uh, note that the trestle actually in the uh, railroad line is not completed. Uh, looking further upstream, you see other buildings. Um, uh, looks like, I think another mill, possibly a warehouse. And then you come to the first picture we've ever had of the Washington Canoe Club. Right in the center of the picture, you see the Washington Canoe Club in 1905, probably. Um, lovely picture. The mill we saw in the previous pictures is on the right of us there. You can see the railroad trestle uh, upstream. You see the other mill, a warehouse, a uh, kind of a neat picture of a sailing sloop out on the river. Um, so this gives you an idea of the location of the, the, the club. It was in a it wasn't in a remote place. There was buildings up and down the river um, at, that, uh, at, at that point. And of course the canal was a major commercial thoroughfare at that point. Uh, a little later, uh, the railroad trestle is gone and I'm not gonna go into the full story here, but you see in this picture, a railroad train, uh, a engine uh, and car and actually a, um, a flat car that's bringing in lumber. This, um, the old trestle was removed. It was never used as a railroad despite the enormous amount of work went into it. And uh, in 1908, they began work on the Georgetown Spur Railroad, which is now the Capitol Crescent Trail. So in, uh, instead of having a trestle running in front of the canoe club, we had a railroad running behind the canoe club. And that of course later became an active commercial line. This is from 1947 with the, um, uh, 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 freight train coming down the uh, Georgetown Spur into Georgetown to deliver, deliver building supplies. Uh, you can see the Washington Canoe Club there in the background and Dempsey's Boathouse in the, in the foreground here. In 1985, the railroad car was, was uh, abandoned and over a period of years, Sally Strain and a bunch of the rest of us um, helped to make the Capitol Crescent Trail. And now we have this wonderful trail that's used by two million uh, people a year. A couple of other interesting pictures here is the construction of uh, Key Bridge, uh, which took place between 1920 and 1923. You can see beyond it the old aqueduct bridge. We saw an earlier picture of it when it was just a wagon bridge. Later it became a car bridge and had a trolley line across it. And until the 1920s, that was the way you got across the Potomac from Virginia to Georgetown. Um, the aqueduct bridge uh, was finally torn down in 1931, uh, well after the uh, key bridge was established. But part of what's interesting in this picture is you can see the shoreline. Well, Georgetown below the bridge is obviously industrial, um, up, but upstream, while there is some tree cover, you can al also see many other um, boathouses and uh, I guess bathhouses. I don't have a warehouses. I don't have a lot of information on it. And up at the far end, well, there was a um, uh, foundry, um, uh, but you can't actually, this is probably after the foundry had come down. 
one of the things I found as I did some uh, research was the number of boathouses that existed along the uh, along the river. And uh, I had an artist just draw this up, but there was the Potomac Boat Club had three different boathouses over time. Dempsey's was a huge one. Analostan Club was around, but there were uh, at least 14 boathouses along the waterfront here and actually going all the way up to uh, uh, Sycamore Island. So it's the wonderful history, which I may do an article on at some point about the history of the, of the boathouses along the Potomac. Um, in the summers, <laughs> This is still an issue today, and we can re recognize it today. The uh, it gets hot in Washington, and until the 1940s and 1950s, there wasn't either commercial or residential air conditioning. So, what were people to do? Well, go out and live along the river, the coolest place. Spend the summer out on the river. So that's what people did in tents, in shacks, cabins. Uh, they found a way, lean-tos. They found a way to spend the summer out there. This is a family um, they call the Havens family that actually joined the Washington Canoe Club in 1918, and uh, they're still active in it. Uh, fifth generation is now active in the club. They built a cabin called uh, Camp Tut, and they would come out. Um, they lived in Arlington, but they'd come out and spend the whole summer um, along, uh, along the river where, where it was a little cooler. Some of the camps were quite fancy. This is Colonial Camp. They had 16 tents. They had platforms. They had uh, a kitchen, uh, a big a kitchen camp, which uh, doubled as a dance floor. And uh, you can see it's uh, quite different than some of the uh, sort of shacks that were, were put up. But the, this, uh, this uh, camping on the Potomac uh, created quite a society and there are all kinds of events that we can track uh, that took place, socials and, and a lot of uh, community activity. Lots of competition. Uh, legend has it that that's where Washington Canoe Club racers really developed their uh, prowess in, in in competition. Was these kids spending all summer uh, just racing up and down the river and, and swimming? So it was a it was a really neat domestic scene, and I I, um, I wish I had an aerial aerial view of it to see all the camps, but they were from most accounts there were dozens dozens of them. The women and the kids would be around during the day. The men would actually get in their canoes or kayaks, paddle down the river uh, to one of the docks, uh, get out, take the trolley car to work, come home in the streetcar, and come back up in the evening. So it was a um, it was a it was a real social social scene at that point. Um, but not it wasn't always the riverbank was not always a calm um, calm place uh, because as you know the Potomac is prone to flooding and. Uh, We've had many floods over the years. Uh, in, flood, in fact, it usually floods in a minor way uh, every year and every roughly every 10 years there, there have been major floods. Uh, this, is, um, this is actually the flood of record at Chain Bridge, uh, which you all know. This is the old Chain Bridge. Our, this is the sixth, I think this is the sixth of seven or seventh of eight iterations of Chain Bridge, 1936. But you can see, um, the, the current bridge is a little higher than this. This is looking from the Virginia shore to Maryland, to uh, the DC side, but a lot of, lot of water in the river uh, at that point. And not only were there floods, but uh, ice flows. On Valentine's Day in 1918, a huge backup of ice uh, from the 14th Street Bridge, or it was called the Long Bridge in those days, um, backed all the way up, uh, actually took out Dempsey's boathouse. You can see the uh, part of the roof of Dempsey's buckling here, and by the end of the, uh, when the floods receded, the whole boathouse was um, was a loss and had to be re replaced. But the Washington Canoe Club on the left there is, despite having ice backed up to its uh, uh, almost to its second floor, survived survived the flood. And the the Canoe Club has been a survivor. This is this is another boathouse, and you see the havoc that's re. But here's the Washington Canoe Club. Um, which has survived flood after flood, ice, ice flow after ice flow, probably for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is we have this flow, basically flow through structure. Um, the first floor is on um, piles, pillars, and the water, uh, flood waters can flow through, maybe it knocks out a wall or two, but by the end, when the flood's over, we get a hose, hose it out, um, put the walls back up and we're back in business. We also, there's a little anomaly in the shoreline. So we have a little physiographic protection because 
the water actually hits this slight point of land and by the time it comes to the canoe club it's somewhat in, in eddy and coming upstream rather than hard downstream and that's that's helped save the canoe club uh, over the years but the floods continue 1996 we had two very high floods almost you can see almost up to the second floor this actually did go into the second floor eventually of the canoe club and uh, the cycle, when I've looked at the cycles back to the 1880s, they are major floods about every 10 years. We have, we have not had a really big flood since 1996, so we're overdue, and uh, it makes us nervous, obviously. The other thing that's been a challenge along the uh, waterfront has been fires. Uh, I mentioned Dempsey's Boathouse earlier, and Dempsey's was taken by fire in 1960. Uh, one and uh, was never rebuilt after this. So that's something that's always been uh, a worry for us. So I'm gonna pause there for a second, see if there are any questions. Okay, I think I'll, oh, Carol. I just wanted to say these pictures are absolutely fabulous. I've never seen <laughs> anything like this. <laughs> well, I mean, who knew all this was happening along our uh, familiar riverfront? Well, you see why I got excited about doing the book. I do indeed. Thank looking, you. <laughs> looking at the pictures, thank you. It's yeah, it just, I mean, I never get tired of looking at these pictures. Okay, so now we're gonna look at the craft that have plied the river. Um, we're all familiar with the birch bark canoes that were actually probably not so much in this area, but around the country, this was the original Indian way of getting, a Native American way of getting around. Uh, this is an, actually an Ojibwe family in, uh, in Wisconsin, uh, but a wonder, wonderful picture. But then um, starting in the 1880s or so, there were new modes of manufacture. Wooden canvas canoes were being built it turned out they were quite cheap to build and could be um, could be afforded by the growing uh, middle class. And this this was a wonderful way to experience leisure, get out get out on the river. There was uh, you know, a lot of uh, you know opportunity for courting, for privacy, for getting away from the prying eyes of uh, Victorian uh, chaperones. Um, but you know, there was always the, the, the risk that someone would try to take advantage of the situation and uh, get carried away a little bit. And uh, this, um, it was, I guess, irresistible temptation, although it's always a little ambiguous in this, uh, in this picture about whether, who's the aggressor here. But uh, anyway, a, ha a happy couple out on the river. Um, one of, somebody who wa was watching this show a while ago said, um, was this considered safe sex? And I, th I think it was. One of the distinctions I make in the book is between rowing and paddling. Rowers who go in shells or, um, or skulls face backwards. They use long oars. Uh, and this is what they look like. Here's a Potomac Boat Club uh, rowers out in the uh, uh, river in the 1880s. Paddlers, on the other hand, face forward. They use a paddle rather than an oar, and uh, it comes in, in, in many forms. Uh, here's a, that was a war canoe with 15 paddlers. Here's just a solo canoeist with a single paddle, but there's also double paddles, double blade paddles. If you glance at this, you'd say, well, these, this is a crew team, not at all. These, this is a four person, um, uh, two blade, or now we call it kayaking team. And this is, this is um, what, what that looks like. So. Um, these guys are not rowers, and please don't ever say to a paddler, oh, well, um, what, you know, did you break your oar or something like that? We're, we use paddles. Competition became a big, big deal very, very quickly at the canoe club um, uh, here in uh, the 1920s, uh, um, a race with two high kneeling paddlers. And this is actually the uh, Olympic sport. Uh, you'd think it'd be sitting down, but the actual Olympic sport that's competed is um, either for single blade is high kneeling, either solo or double. You can see an example of that, of that here. This was a huge 
hugely popular spectator sport. This is actually from Brooklyn, New York, but uh, 30,000 people turned out for a canoe championship. Uh, this was a day when there were already was baseball and football and other things, but, but canoeing and canoe racing was a, a tremendously popular um, pastime. And of course it was, it was free. You could go down to the river and watch it, which made it uh, uh, different from some of the other sports. In 1924, the uh, uh, Olympic Committee, International Olympic Committee, decided to have uh, canoeing as a demonstration sport and uh, both uh, single blade and double blade. Uh, they had to select a team uh, from North America and uh, the Canadians sent uh, uh, several paddlers. The entire US contingent was from the National, uh, from the Washington Canoe Club. And this, this is our four paddlers on the way to the Paris Olympics where they um, excelled. They came home with, uh, I think, four or five gold medals and a number of others. And Olympic paddling was launched, although it didn't become an official sport till 1936. But the, this is an important part of the history of the Washington Canoe Club that we were there for the launch of canoeing as, a, as, as an Olympic sport. Um, next generation uh, uh, came along a guy called Frank Havens. His uncle was on that uh, 1924 Olympic team. Uh, his father, who was actually the best paddler in the country, uh, was unable to go to the Olympics for reasons I'll explain in a minute. And Frank, but Frank, uh, the son, who was born in 1924, took up the sport, became very good at it. And in 1952, he won the gold medal in Helsinki in the 10,000 meter um, uh, single blade paddle uh, high kneel event. He sent this uh, telegram home to his father. Dear dad, I had a wonderful time here in Finland competing for the United States. I'm on the way home today. The 10,000 meter was a real challenge. Let me tell you, the Hungarian and the Czech were ahead of me all the way, but I gave it my all. Pappy, there's something else I want you to know. This, this always makes me very emotional. Thanks for staying home and waiting around for me to be born uh, back in 1924. I'm coming home with a gold medal you should, you should have won. Your loving son, Frank. Um, you know, amazing, amazing story. <clears throat> so, you know, Frank Havens, along with a lot of other people was now a renowned athlete, gold medalist at the Olympics. So President Eisenhower, new to the office, had a luncheon in June of that year, or June 1953, with the 44 greatest athletes in the United States. And um, a couple of you might, re on the, to the left of Eisenhower, two Hall of Fame um, baseball players, Trish Speaker and Calvin Griffith. Um, to the right, the woman, is, what's her name, Hall, she was a golfer. But then Gene Sarenson, the golfer, and then you see Joe DiMaggio, and you see Rocky Marciano. So this was a big deal. And I loved seeing this picture, which um, Frank Haven's family gave me. But, but they said, you know, the trouble with this picture is Frank's not in it, but he was there. So I went to the Eisenhower Library in, um, in Abilene, Kansas, and wonderful uh, research librarian helped me. And she found this picture. And on the far left in the light suit is Frank Haven's. So he was there. So great picture from my book, except Joe DiMaggio has now disappeared. And I want Joe in the book. So I've got a high tech solution to this, which is Photoshop. And here's Joe DiMaggio. And in the far upper left is Frank Havens. Uh, but there, when you're doing a history book, there are ethical issues. And uh, I felt and the publisher completely agreed that no, we don't Photoshop pictures. So the picture I ended up using in the book was, was the picture, oops, wait was this picture with, with, no, I'm sorry, was this picture. I used the picture with Frank and Joe DiMaggio just missed out on his 15 minutes of fame, I guess. So um, uh, Carol asked earlier about um, women paddlers and from the get-go, even though women were still in long skirts and they weren't allowed to be members of the club, they were formidable paddlers. Um, our, our star paddler started out as a diver and swimmer, but she turned into a very strong paddler, Miss Elizabeth Smith. She won championships uh, uh, for a whole decade, sometimes pairing with men, sometimes on her own. Um, 
uh, women continued to be active in paddling in the 1960s. The um, US Olympic team wanted to get more women into paddling. They sent some uh, war canoes to the uh, Potomac, uh, to the Potomac Boat Club and the Washington Canoe Club, and uh, women began to participate uh, uh, in the sport. And I, this, uh, I just, I love the headline, modish paddling war canoes on Potomac is a modest sport for teen girls. Um, uh, they weren't called girls for very long after that. One particular story uh, was a woman called Francine Fox, who was a um, junior high student at, um, what was the junior high? What was it called before? It's called Key Junior, uh, Hardy Junior High now. Can't remember the name of it. Anyway, she was there on the playground uh, playing tag and one of her schoolmates who had already started paddling said, Francine, you should come down and learn to paddle. And Pat Francine did, um, she was 13. And within six months, she was a national kayak champion. And three years later, she went to the Olympics and she was Olympic silver medalist. Uh, first uh, women's medals uh, that were ever won uh, in flat water paddling were won by two uh, tandem team from the Washington uh, Canoe Club, Francine and Lorianne uh, Perrier. Francine went on to uh, continue paddling for a number of years. Today, women uh, are very active, not only in uh, sprint kayaking and canoeing, but also uh, probably the most popular sport is outrigger paddling. Um, we've also got uh, a youth, great youth program learning the uh, Olympic sport of, of high kneel, high kneel uh, canoeing. It's interesting what's happened to the craft. I mean, this is the boat that Frank Havens won the um, gold medal in in 1952. Today, the craft have gotten certainly different materials. That was wood, these are uh, all carbon fiber, but the width of them is just unbelievable. Um, in the center is one of our Olympic hopefuls, actually the number one ranked paddler in the country right now. He's in a 10 inch wide Olympic canoe. You don't know, I would never ever get in a canoe like that. I couldn't stay up, but you get a sense from this picture of, of what's happened to the shape of boats as I've gotten faster and faster. So I'll take a quick uh, break here and see if there are any questions. Well, here I am again, asking Carol. questions. Um, I'm really glad you uh, talked about the, uh, the ev evolution of the, uh, of the canoe because I saw some of the huge advances that were occurring with the, um, the shells for the rowing shells. Um, so I was interested in that. I was gonna ask you, in addition to the exhibitions and the racing that was very popular, uh, I come from Canada and one of the things that you see an awful lot was regattas and, um, and synchronized paddling. Was that something that you, that you would see also here? Wow, how interesting. Um, regattas, yes. I mean, we had lantern shows and uh, you know, uh, late night or uh, late evening paddles and so on. Um, synchronized paddling, that's a new one. I, I didn't run into that. And that may have occurred, but I never ran into that as I studied the history. Uh, ah, well, I, maybe someday we can talk and I can tell you about that. <laughs> would love to hear about that. Yeah. Um, another question I noticed was the, um, the, the I, I wasn't familiar with the kneeling, um, the, um, the, 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 the kneeling canoes. Yeah. Um, but I'm, I noticed how very low to the water they are, and I presume that was for stability's sake. Well, I don't even remotely understand the nautical uh, engineering or, uh, of, of these things. I mean, they're, they're inherently unstable. You've got this huge amount of weight above the waterline yeah. and almost none below the waterline. So yes, if you can get it a little bit deeper, but, uh, but uh, I mean, particularly the, the versions that are race now and what you're seeing in this picture is uh, uh, two of the high kneel canoes. I mean, those are what's used in the Olympics and I don't understand how they stay upright. And, and the water is choppy. This is a river, this isn't a lake. And so I would imagine that adds to the instability issue, the, but uh, real athleticism guys, required. Carol, these guys go out in white caps. I can't yeah. believe it. It's nuts. It's nuts. <laughs> they get, I was out, <laughs> in the spring a couple of years ago and the juniors were just learning this and I spent a lot of time fishing kids out of the water on a <laughs> fairly windy day because um, it's, it's a very unstable uh, kind of craft. Yeah, thank you, Chris. Okay.
good. So the final portion is about the club itself. Um, after the Civil War, um, people had more leisure, people, more people were living in cities and uh, many more uh, kind of fraternal organizations uh, began to form social clubs. Um, uh, there was a lot of bonding that went on. Um, uh, the, uh, there was also a big emphasis on physical culture, which we'd call probably today health and well-being, but weightlifting and other specific exercise programs. This is actually uh, somewhat later, uh, the Washington Canoe Club wrestling team. And, and the Canoe Club, these guys, they just wanted to compete. I mean, they had baseball, football, basketball teams, swimming, uh, water polo. They even had a track team that went to the uh, went to the Penn Relays. So uh, the, the uh, Canoe Club had really, really strong uh, uh, ethic about uh, competition in any way you could you could have it. I, I wonder how these guys even had time to go to work, honestly. Um, one of the other competitions that was very popular but very brutal was uh, called um, tilting. It was take off on the old knights charging each other with horses. Instead of that, you're standing on the edge of your canoe with somebody paddling and you charge them and try to knock them into the water. And swimming, I mean, this is a kind of a quiet picture of the canoe club on the float of the canoe club, but if there was an opportunity to compete, the Washington Canoe Club folks were gonna do that and here they are starting. And here's what they thought up. How about a race, a long distance race from Chain Bridge to the Canoe Club? It's about three miles, let's do that. Well, Chain Bridge isn't ordinarily the kind of place you'd wanna start a canoe, uh, uh, a swimming race, but in fact, for uh, almost 20 years, they had a three mile uh, swimming race from Chain Bridge. In 1925, after the race had already been going for, oh, uh, 14 years, they persuaded President Calvin Coolidge to sponsor the race. And this was the first annual President's Cup canoe race. And it was actually the first long distance canoe race, uh, I'm sorry, long distance swimming race in, uh, in, in America and the American Amateur Athletic Union um, supported that. So here they are um, uh, and they would build a platform and this is where the races start. And just one of the very many tricky things of doing a book, I looked and looked and looked at this picture and said, you know, that just doesn't look like the uh, Maryland bank of the river. And somebody said, well, what if you flip the picture? So I flipped the picture, same picture and it, looks more like it, but I still, the picture was labeled canoe club uh, or um, swim race start 1923. And I still am not sure which way the picture goes, um, but it's, uh, anyway, that's an aside of the technical challenges of doing a book. The, um, anyway, this was the race. Uh, this was the start, people taking off, uh, swimming down. You can see the uh, bridge in the background there swimming down uh, uh, toward the canoe club. And then at the, at the end, there would be a, a, war, a ward ceremony and so on. These races went on until the 19, well, the President's Cup continued into the 1960s or 1970s. Some of you may even remember uh, when that was being competed. And it had added at that point, a number of events, rowing um, and canoe racing, sailing events and so on. But by the time I, came to Washington, which was in 1954, um, it had turned actually mostly into a hydroplane race with high speed um, motorboats. And we used to go down and watch uh, uh, off um, uh, West Potomac Park as these races raced around below Memorial Bridge. Um, it died out and I don't know quite why, but the, uh, sometime around 1970, the, the whole President's Cup Regatta was discontinued. The Canoe Club, in addition to competition, though, is a wonderful place um, for families to keep, teach kids safety, to keep, teach them the art um, and the ethics of, of, of paddling, both, you know, summertime activities, wintertime activities, uh, uh, when the river used to freeze every, every winter. Uh, it just was a uh, great place to fund the fro frolic, to, the, to play, um, fool around, here's a uh, race, uh, standing, stand up race in, in canoes uh, uh, one, one afternoon. You can see, by the way, in the background, uh, the aqueduct bridge now has 
uh, cars on it. And in the background, very background, you can see the arches of Key Bridge. So you can sort of date when this uh, photograph was taken between 1920-1923. The Canoe Club has been a destination for long distance voyagers. Here's a brigade paddling in from Ottawa uh, all the way to Washington to uh, highlight issues uh, between Canada and the United States uh, regarding clean water. Uh, we also had a visit from the Hokulea, a sailing, a Polynesian sailing vessel that came all the way from Hawaii via India and around the Cape of, the Cape, uh, Cape of Good Hope. Uh, fascinating story that you could do a whole show on that, which, uh, but I'll just tell you, they came docked for 10 days at the canoe club and uh, we had probably a thousand visitors who came, uh, school kids and others to learn about what it's like to um, use uh, traditional navigation to cross the oceans, uh, what it's like to live on a boat like this uh, with 14 other people for weeks on end with no one in sight. Uh, really, a, really a wonderful, wonderful uh, experience for us to just meet the crew of the, of, of the uh, Hokulea. We also each year host uh, Team River Runner uh, a couple times. Uh, this is wounded warriors from uh, Walter Reed and other places who come down and they do uh, events. They've learned, uh, we have specially adapted kayaks so they can race the kayaks. Um, it's a, uh, they do a wheelchair race on the Capitol Crescent Trail as part of a biathlon. It's an absolutely wonderful way for these uh, women and men to rehabilitate, to start feeling strong and uh, capable again. It's a, 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 we're very pleased to be able to host this each year. We also host many youth programs, uh, uh, trying to, you know, honestly diversify the kinds of people who are paddling. It's, it's uh, our club is um, sadly mostly uh, almost entirely white, and uh, uh, there aren't that many people of color who are using uh, who are paddling. And so we're we've been working for a number of years to help change that. We have great social events, uh, lots I could tell about, but this is back in the uh, 40s, 50s, 60s, and maybe some of you remember this. There used to be Watergate concerts down at the steps there. Lincoln Memorial is off to the right, but huge uh, crowds would come and gather on the steps, uh, and the National Symphony Orchestra is on a barge on the left there playing to this group, and you could paddle your canoe down, and this is late afternoon, but it went into the evening, so it would be kind of a... Uh, dark just to sit there in the canoe and to listen to the music and uh, just enjoy enjoy the evening uh, with friends. We uh, continue that tradition in some ways today uh, every year for the 4th of July canoe club members uh, paddle down and uh, enjoy the 4th of July uh, fireworks uh, from our from our boats. One last story and then I'll wind up. Um, in 19 51, 1952, a woman named Ruth DeForest moved to Washington and she was, had already started paddling, but she was interested in serious paddling. She became the best kayaker, women kayaker in the United States and she qualified for the US Olympic team, um, ready to go to Helsinki for a couple of reasons, but what it boils down to is gender discrimination. She was not allowed to go. She trained with Frank Havens and was all ready to go to the Olympics. And they said, well, you really, uh, we think you need a chaperone, even though other women in track and field on the team did not have chaperones. So she didn't get to go. Sad story. She um, moved to California. She left, she moved to California. She became a tennis and golf champion, had a family and so on. So 44 years later, Frank Havens calls up Ruth and says, Ruth, the World Masters Games are in um, Washington State next year. Let's let's compete. So this is now they're both in their God, 60s, 70s. So Ruth gets a plank, puts it across her swimming pool, and starts training for her kayaking, sit, sitting out in her swimming pool with a paddle. They went to the games and they won eight medals between them. And this is uh, this article that came out. Uh, uh, that talked about it, and uh, here they're sharing one of their medals even even later. But it's, it was, you know, a wonderful story. Ruth, who is now 92, 
spunky as can be, she watched my slideshow. She helped me a little bit with the book and she watched my slideshow and, and got the book. And she said, Chris, you've created a masterpiece, which seemed a little bit of an overstatement, but uh, she, uh, she, you know, wonderful, wonderful person, an important part of our history. So um, this, this is a club um, in the 1940s, wonderful place to hang out. This is the club is envisioned by a unknown artist as rendering, uh, which you know, kind of kind of captures the magnificence and the magic and the mystery of the Washington Canoe Club. Um, we are now um, our building's very dilapidated. We're just uh, embarking on a, um, a long-term project to rehab have the whole building, but um, because uh, it's unsafe for occupancy, we are except for a small portion, we are actually not even in our clubhouse these days, but the club has grown by leaps and bounds. Our programs are robust. Our membership is the largest it's ever been. Um, so this is the book. If you wanna get it, uh, you can go to the Washington Canoe Club book uh, site. You can go buy it on Amazon, Politics and Prose, wherever you like to get your books. But um, that's a little bit of the story of the Washington Canoe Club. I've had the great, good fortune to be a member for 30 years and it's just really enriched my life. So I'm glad to share some of this with you. Thank you. That was wonderful, uh, Chris. Does anyone have any questions for Chris? Carolyn does. You gotta take yourself off mute. This is getting embarrassing. Um, yes, I mean, this is a topic that absolutely fascinates me. So um, I, I do have some questions. I'm interested in the selection criteria for membership. How many, you said the membership is growing. How many members do you have today? Um, also, do did and do members um, uh, bring their own canoes, provide their own canoes? We have, we've, uh, we have about 300 members now. Um, we've, raised the cap from 200 to 300 over the last couple of years. Um, we're kind of stable uh, that for the moment because, because of the pandemic, the use of the club was a lot lower and we wanna kind of see with that many members, whether there's crowding, whether there's this loss of the sense of community that we've always had. Um, probably three quarters of the members have their own boats and there's a certain amount of storage, but there are canoes, kayaks, stand up paddle boards, uh, and I guess maybe outrigger canoes that can be used by people who don't have their own boats. Mm -hmm. And the, the membership is open. I, if we, if, if I don't, I, as far as I know at the moment, we're not oversubscribed, but we're very close to our cap. And at that point we'd have to have a waiting list. Thank you. It sounds like a fascinating activity for Palisades Village for us to have, to go out on the waters and, and paddle, yeah. especially now that we have the history behind us. Chris, can you tell us a little bit more about yourself and uh, how you got involved and what your experiences with um, canoeing and? Sure, well, I, I mean, I did a little bit. I grew up in New Hampshire and did a little bit of canoeing and lakes there, um, but, what really changed my life was I mo went, moved to Chicago for graduate school and started teaching school out there. And I rented a canoe from a wonderful guy called Ralph Fries. He was a blacksmith in Chicago, but in the city, but he also built canoes. And I rented a canoe from him. And uh, then I did again. He was an amazing raconteur about the, all the history of the voyageurs and everything about Marquette and Joliet and everything. He knew everything about for 500 miles of streams around Washington and around Chicago. So I began paddling a lot every weekend and it became what I wanted to do. Uh, when I uh, left Chicago, I eventually ended up in Washington working for the National Park Service. And uh, um, this was a great place to paddle. Uh, I worked my last 30 years was working for the Park Service uh, and American Rivers and the, and the US Forest Service. And, so lots of travel and always it was traveling to rivers. So I got the uh, uh, opportunity to paddle in 50 states one way or another. So that's kind of a very quick biography. You certainly must have seen a lot of wildlife. Um, 
Yes, I have. I mean, things you see along rivers, moose, otter, uh, foxes, raccoons. You can, you know, if we paddle sometime on the Potomac, not infrequently I see deer along the river. Of course, we see deer everywhere <laughs> in the Palisades, so that's not a big, <laughs> a big treat. But it is kind of neat to see them down near the near the river, and, and you know, lots, lots and lots of bird life. Uh, one of the pleasures of paddling in the Potomac is to going out in February, and you begin to see the ducks and the geese come in. They build their nests, and then along about mid-April or end of April, the goslings and the ducklings are out on the river. So it's um, you're fine, kind of um, part of the rhythms of nature. Does anyone have any other questions or comments for Chris? Can, can I ask one more question? <laughs> this is so embarrassing. Um, those swimmers, I keep thinking about them. They were swimming against the tide, were they not? Or, or against the current? Um, it's pretty forceful, I understand, in the Potomac River. They must have been quite athletic. And, and what an endurance test, too. Yeah, three miles is a, is a ways. Well, this real, it, it's sort of fascinating. I mean, as I said, swimming from Chain Bridge is not something you want to do. You saw somebody drown there uh, yesterday or the day before. Yeah. Um, it's, it's a very hazardous place. So it's almost inconceivable that they had swimming races. They did them in August when the water was low. Um, you're right about the tide, but um, if you're uh, depending on the t if the tide's coming in or going out, that would make a difference. I wouldn't be surprised when they tried to schedule it when the tide was going out. So you'd have both the current of the river and the outgoing tide to pull you along a little bit. Mm. Um, but by the race started in 1911, it became the President's Cup in 1925. By 1930, they changed the course and it became a triangular course down around Key Bridge. It was, I think somebody finally said, this is, <laughs> this is not safe. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this was a, a, just a really eye-opening, very educational, historical. Um, it, it, it actually brought so much more meaning to when you, um, you bike by or you pass by it, it. It really brings it to life, the historical significance. And we really thank you for sharing this with us um, this afternoon, Chris. It was certainly a delight. Um, and uh, hopefully we will see you on the river. Good. Yeah, my pleasure, uh, Andrea. Thank you. And thanks uh, to, for everybody for coming. Thank you. That was really a wonderful presentation. I enjoyed every minute of it. I'm sorry I was late because I missed some good stuff. Yes. <laughs> Thankfully, it's recorded. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, some of it's in the book. As I said, half of the pictures uh, you saw today are in the book. Half aren't in their other pictures you didn't see today. So if you want to learn a little more, that's you can see it there. And you said that the book is available on Amazon and um, also, is it on the Everywhere. website, the Washington Canoe? It's on the Washington Canoe Club website. It's at, you know, I was in politics and prose yesterday. It's there. Um, mm -hmm. I'm a little frustrated. The publisher promised it would be in all the uh, drug stores and hardware stores in our area. And everyone I've been to, because they have a rack of these Images of America books, and the Canoe Club book is not in any of them. So you'll have to get it another way. I've, I've, I've complained to them and said, you know, it would be selling, but they haven't done it. Well, thank you so much, Chris, and thank you all for joining us on this uh, lovely, cool afternoon in our homes. And we look forward to seeing many of you next Thursday for our first uh, outdoor event that Palisades Village is having on the grounds of the Palisades Hub, which was the uh, former Palisades Community Church. So uh, we'll see you next time. Take care and stay cool. Thank you. Thanks thank so much. You. Bye-bye. So